Great. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the uh, video game lunch. I think it really speaks to the software circus spirit that while people are trying to eat dinner, we're actually trying to make them uh, trying to eat lunch. We're trying to make them watch CS go. That was recorded um, last Sunday. I was involved. Our team went out in the first round and I apologize for all the swearing. Uh, I've got a few apologies to do. Uh, sorry, not apologies. Announcements. Apologies will come later. Uh, first of all, uh, We've had a lot of amazing speakers this morning, but there's a lot of people uh, running around behind the scenes trying to make all this happen. Um, Carla and team are doing an incredible job. We've got our sound guys here that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. And I also wanna give a shout out to um, someone who's spiritually very involved in the software circus, Richard Sienitzer, who hasn't involved, been involved in this one. He's been involved in a lot of the story this far. Um, also, you may have noticed if you're following Software Circus uh, Twitter, that we have a graphic recorder um, who is making, uh, what would you say that, illustrations of all the talks and putting them up on Twitter. That's a great way if you've missed any of them to get up to speed quickly later. I also hear that we have uh, 700 people currently online and it's growing all the time. Um, we have 1400 registered and we're expecting that as the states wake up, it's going to get busier and busier. And before I introduce Peeny, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Uh, that's Packet, where I work, Container Solutions, of course, who are uh, a big part of this story. Um, sound guys, I'm not sure if your audio is on, but it maybe shouldn't be. Um, another shout out to Rancher, OfferZen, the CNCF, Honeycomb, Aqua Security, Kinfolk, Giant Swarm, and Cloud Bees. Uh, if you go to Brella, you can click on sponsors and you can go through and speak to representatives from all of those companies to ask them more about it. But now there's nothing else for me to do than to introduce Pini Resnick with a round of applause. Unfortunately, Pini's talk isn't called How to Beat a Global Pandemic with by Becoming Cloud Native, but we're gonna take the second best, How to Beat an Existential Crisis by Becoming Cloud Native from Pini Resnick, CTO at uh, Container Solutions, and one of the original founders of the Software Circus. Take it away, Pini. Thank you. And uh, there will be global pandemic involved. So, um, okay, let's start. Um, so first, the entire story is actually going to be based on this book that we finished a few months ago. And this is actually the actual book. We're going to ruffle a few of them. And if you go to our booth uh, on the left side of the, of the sponsors thing, uh, of the Brella thing, you can find a free excerpt and a bunch of nice people to talk to uh, about the book or anything else. So <clears throat> I'm going to tell a story. And this story will be about a stranger coming to town. Um, so. But before I tell the story, let me introduce a bit the company that we're going to talk about. And uh, the company is called WorldGrid. It's not a real company. It's, uh, it's sort of compilation of our customers and uh, uh, sort of uh, average of what we would uh, typically see in the market. It's a successful financial company, mid-size, mid to big size, and uh, pretty successful again. And uh, they're making good money. They have uh, good products. and pretty happy staff and customers. And our main character in this story is Jenny, who is a technical manager. So she's a sort of development operations manager. She's in charge of, uh, of building uh, and maintaining the products that Will's Grid is building. And we also have engineers and senior executives. They come as needed. So who are the strangers in our world? And we are talking about uh, financial, uh, financial uh, companies, but really it could happen in any other field. So the first type of, uh, of uh, stranger is, uh, is a new company, a cloud or uh, uh, a challenger bank, basically a bank that uh, didn't exist a few years ago. And then uh, uh, when they started in 2014, and once they actually got moving that they could build an entire bank, functional bank with actual functional banking accounts in less than a year. The another uh, typical stranger coming to this market is uh, uh, 
somebody like Amazon. So um, it's a, it doesn't have to be Amazon. It's a big, uh, 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 it's a, uh, sorry. One second. Yeah, so Amazon is a sort of large enterprise uh, um, IT company that is entering the financial market. So for example, Amazon has a banking license and uh, uh, they could uh, actually get up to 70 million by some estimations, up to 70 million customers, uh, banking customers in US alone in just a matter of few years. Um, so, and the third one is ING, somebody like ING Bank, a traditional bank that uh, spent the last decade basically building an IT capabilities. Uh, just the sound guys. Thank you. Um, so, um, right. Hey, so, so guys, I'm sorry to interrupt, Penny. So, guys, we can hear you. We can hear you in room one. If you could please mute. Thank you. Please go ahead, Penny. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. So that sort of took my attention away. So back to the challenges. So the other new stranger, which I, I promised uh, the pandemic. So uh, although those other strangers like new competitors, they're sort of partially predictable. And then once in a while, something like this happens. It's very real. But uh, we can see how that affects the uh, the company, the business too. So, <clears throat> what happens with uh, Worldgood is that they're actually delivering pretty good value, pretty consistently, uh, linearly. And uh, when the new disruptive uh, technology companies come to the market, that they capture the market share very fast, right, uh, in exponential way. So imagine Uber or Airbnb very difficult industries, very distributed and global, and uh, just a single company dramatically dominates those markets today. And it could happen in any other field, like for example, supermarkets, Amazon bought uh, Whole Foods, so it could happen in any market. And the thing is that, uh, so basically the reason for this to happen is because um, those new uh, companies, they, they have much faster learning loop. So they can, build the value, they can build their products in a variety of different ways, very quickly deliver to the customer, see the result, based on that respond uh, with new changes that actually uh, help them to adjust the product very quickly, many, many times, and deliver much better products very quickly. So what happens is basically, uh, for, from the traditional company perspective, like Wellsgate, when uh, the uh, in the beginning the market share doesn't really change. When the new company comes to the market, it's very difficult to even see them. Somebody like Starling in the beginning, for years they had only maybe a few thousand customers. Uh, but once they actually get any sort of traction, thousands of tens of thousands of customers, then they get more funding and put all this funding into engineering and development. So actually they start developing even faster. So they, uh, they grow and they capture the market again in an exponential way. And the way traditional enterprises respond is typically by cutting costs. Um, and the first way, where, uh, the easiest way to cut costs is on engineering uh, and innovation. So that's what they do. And at that point, typically when they realize that they have to respond, it's already too late. And, uh, and they're essentially losing the, uh, the war for market share. <clears throat> and then again, uh, something totally unpredictable may happen to everyone, not just to older companies like Wellgood, but also to newer 
once and everyone is in trouble. So there are two types of existential crises. So the first one is actually uh, the, the slow one. That's, the, that's where the, the competitor comes to market. You see it, you see the change, you see that they're starting to use cloud native technologies. They're going to, uh, they're, they're delivering value faster. Uh, and it takes maybe five to 10 years until the market totally adopts the cloud native technologies. So it's sort of visible, but it's very slow, like uh, when the child grows. And as a parent, you don't see the changes, but others from outside see actually how the child grows. If they see, uh, see the child every six months or a year. So back to Jenny. Again, she is a development manager. She's a middle manager. And she sees, sees those changes and she really wants to respond. And in the beginning, she says, I mean, Kubernetes, you know, we all go, the, this type of people and the engineers, they go to uh, technical conferences like this one, or like KubeCon or DockerCon. They see amazing talks, like, for example, the one that Kelsey did in the first software circus, where he was playing Tetris on the stage in, in live in Kubernetes. And it seems very easy. So how hard could it be to just get a couple of Kubernetes clusters, move everything to microservices and deploy to public cloud? And apparently it's actually quite difficult. Um, it, it's uh, about six to 12 months after trying to do it, it's part of normal work, just part of a uh, normal backlog of delivery, delivering the value. Uh, there is no much happening actually. It's um, uh, the tiny, portion of work is done. Maybe there is some dysfunctional or partially functional Kubernetes cluster. There are some things that are working, but nothing really is done. So at that point, Jenny thinks we need to do something else. We need to, uh, um, we need to invest properly. So for that, she decides that it's better to split the team into innovation part so the part that will build a new platform and, new, uh, and use new technology and the legacy delivery part, <clears throat> who will continue maintaining the, the old part, the legacy part of the system. After spending two or three months uh, defining the approach and planning, she goes to CEO, gets the approval and they're good to go. Unfortunately, <clears throat> after another six to 12 months, they realize that not much is actually done again. So again, there is some progress, but uh, the end of the project is not yet visible. So why it's so difficult is, is actually, so this is the first explanation. This is quite old slide, but it, it puts the cloud native, uh, this, this is coming from Cloud Native uh, Compute Foundation, which is actually our sponsors today. Uh, and they define cloud native as microservices, containers, and dynamic orchestration, basically Kubernetes, to build great products faster. So basically, it is about innovation. It's not particularly about scale. It's mostly about innovation. And this specific definition, mostly talking about uh, tech technology. And that's what we see in the market. When we go and talk to different people, that's how people define cloud native. And they think if they use those technologies, they will be fine. So this is a different way to see it, that this cloud native is basically infrastructure up to architecture. In reality, in the way we see it, it's much more holistic, much bigger story. So it also covers the different processes, different team structure, less hierarchy, more cross-functional teams, and uh, different culture. So unless all this is addressed, uh, it's very difficult to get proper value and actually deliver the value faster like those other cloud native companies. Another thing, this is again from CNCF, um, and this is only partial list. Currently it's almost 1400 boxes in this slide. So there is actually too many things to know. There is each one of those represent a product or a company that is building some products to actually build full cloud native platform, you need to know a lot of this stuff. And it's, uh, it's quite complex. So um, now um, getting back to Wells grid, 
basically they got the uh, they spend already six uh, actually uh, one or two, two or maybe three years they spend on uh, trying to build this platform and move to cloud native and actually not much happened. So now the CEO is coming to uh, to Jenny and says essentially you have to deliver the value now because soon the customers will start leaving because we promised them certain features and we don't deliver. At this point, uh, it's almost an ultimatum. It's either we build these five features within six months or three months, uh, or else I'll just cancel the project and we will move off, move on to basically back to legacy or outsource it to somebody else. But it's not something that uh, an engineering team wants to hear. So we need to do something else again. Before I continue, there couple of tools to introduce, so a couple of concepts to, that I'm going to use to actually help Jenny to solve the problem. The first one is difference between creativity and proficiency. So basically every project, every initiative starts from sort of random thinking, uh, uh, sort of experimentation and scientific uh, research, and you just try things. You don't really know what you're doing. Then you slowly moving to heuristics. That's where uh, uh, you have some certain number of people that figured out how it works well, and they sort of can repeat it multiple times, but they cannot really explain to others what's going on and until it becomes fully algorithmic. So imagine McDonald's, when they started, there was one restaurant that was drive through instead of drive in. Uh, Apparently, it was a good idea in hindsight. Then there was uh, some sort of heuristic. After a few years, they could open four or five restaurants. But eventually, today, McDonald's is fully algorithmic. There is actual book. You open a restaurant, you just do everything by the book. Uh, it's important to understand that creativity is not better than proficiency, and proficiency is not better than creativity. They're just different. And there are different processes happening in each one of these stages. It's more about innovation in the beginning, uh, creation of process in the middle, and uh, optimization at the end. There's different structure, organizational structure that is required. It's more towards the hierarchy and bureaucracy at the right end. And you make more money when you actually make it algorithmic because then you can actually use the economy of scale. But without the creativity, you will never get to the proper, uh, proper scale. Uh, and for that, there is an old uh, uh, McKinsey model about three horizons that essentially every company to be successful needs to invest uh, proportionally into delivery, innovation and research. So delivery is something you make money now, innovation you will make money in, uh, in a while, in one or two years from now, and the research is something future, is future. who knows. And unfortunately, today's enterprises, they are spending too much time on delivery and they forget about innovation and research. The tool number two is patterns, or in different words, is design patterns in software world. So they're coming from architecture, from uh, somebody called Christopher Alexander, from these books, and there is more books in the series. And the general idea of patterns is pretty simple. A pattern is a word, like chair, table, sofa. So it's sort of, specific enough so we can talk about this, but it's also generic and open so you can create it in different ways. So imagine a table, we sort of agree what table is, but it's very difficult to define a, uh, a table in a way that it's like four legs or it's more or less impossible to define a table. But when we talk about a table, we have something in mind that we agree on. A language is, uh, is a collection of words on a certain topic, like furniture language. And the stories are designs. Designs are stories. There's a square table with four chairs and a sofa in a room. So imagine we need to uh, we need to tell this story without having the words that we agree on, without having mutual mutually understood language. It's very difficult. And the argument is that uh, when you entering a new discipline, then like uh, Ludwig van which Wittgenstein said is that the limits of my language are limits of my world. Basically, when you're entering into the new discipline, you have no language about the things in that discipline. So you don't even understand how to use the elements uh, uh, in, in, in that field. 
An example is, uh, is a car. So we all know the car. This is an old Volkswagen Golf. Very few people actually know the names of these things, but without knowing the names, but without being even aware that those things uh, exist, you can't even discuss if they are good, bad, you can't suggest solutions for improvements or anything like that. So only mechanics or uh, creators of cars can properly talk about tiny details of a car. And, uh, and then there is a gap between us users of a car and mechanics. And the same is happening in architecture and normal people that when we want to build a house, and we want to talk to a professional architect, there is no common language, right? We don't understand the architectural language and architects don't fully understand what we want from them. And the reason is because we don't even know what we want because we have no even no language to discuss it. So patterns uh, or pattern languages are an attempt to create the common language to talk between non-professional people to professional people. So an example could be when you say, microservices, unless both sides understand what microservices is, there is no conversation. Okay, so what would be a typical uh, design for a company like Wellscreen? <clears throat> and each one of those uh, cards is a pattern and we actually have those all patterns uh, uh, in, in the site called CN Patterns website and even physical cards you, will, uh, you can actually get if you go to, to our booth. And the general idea is that you need to, to plan the, the transformation in a way that, uh, so the, the company, the customer who actually, the company who's actually going through transformation like Wells Grid and professionals who can who help them to set up the tools and set up cloud native systems can discuss and plan it effectively. So this is a typical transformation. The way we see it, it starts from a transformational champion, goes through business case and executive commitment. Then there is a vision and small core team that starts the transformation and the core team builds the, uh, it's a more creative team. It's managed for creativity in the beginning. They build the distributed systems, Kubernetes clusters, cloud native platform. Uh, they experiment, they eventually build MVP or fully functional platform. Um, and then they slowly onboard the rest of the organization to this platform. Uh, they teach them, they help them to refactor the applications uh, and it's gradual product, pro, uh, project rather than just sort of sticking them all together on partially functional platform. And at the end, the, the innovative team, the core team can continue developing new ideas uh, and look into the future while the, the rest of the organization, after moving to new cloud native platform, they can uh, refactor the old applications and eventually uh, become fully cloud native uh, throughout the organization. Each one of these patterns include many other patterns and it's recursive. Um, I'll skip those. What's important though is to keep in mind that not everything is uh, is sort of planned and, and linear, but there are also organizational or cultural patterns. And culture is something that we do, uh, according to Daniel Coyle, something that we do, not something that we are. What it means is that actually, if you change your daily behavior, your routines, your uh, the way you work with people, then uh, you actually can affect the culture. You can change the culture. And those are examples of uh, cultural changes like honest feedback, uh, blameless inquiry, psychological safety, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually you want to, go to get to the point that you have in your backlog, not just the tasks that are relevant for current products, but also innovative tasks and research tasks. Now, few words, a short version of, uh, of a fast developing crisis. And obviously, I mean, the entire world is through the looking glass, right? It's a, uh, the last two months are pretty crazy. What happened is that it's not just that the newcomers started slowly capturing the market from Wall Street, but the entire market collapsed and, and no one knows what's going on. Some are winning some, but most are losing. We are sitting in our houses. Uh, originally it was, uh, this diagram was created about two months ago. 
but when toilet paper was in high demand for whatever reason. Uh, but we are still sitting at homes and we are doing virtual conference. And two months ago, we wouldn't even imagine that. So in such situation, those patterns that we are using for slow transformation, what, what we saw actually many of those patterns are still very relevant for the crisis like, uh, like the COVID-19. For example, dynamic strategy, that's where you define the strategy for the next couple of years, but you adjust it as you, as you realize that the environment changes. So it makes no, no sense to continue during the crisis like COVID to continue with, uh, with original strategy. We in container solutions, we almost turned the entire company around um, in response to the crisis. Value hierarchy, hierarchy, learning organization, all those can help to uh, explain to the employees and to the customers what we value. And under the crisis, the values become obvious and learning organization is actually tested uh, very heavily. There are also more technical patterns like remote teams, <clears throat> ability to for creative thinking, use of public clouds, and many, many other patterns that actually can help to overcome the, the crisis. The companies who are stuck in their own old thinking and cannot adjust quickly, so essentially, it doesn't matter if the crisis is happening over a period of five years or a period of two months. At the end, it's just a matter of speed. And... Uh, Recently, we also created uh, a separate pattern language for uh, specifically dealing with uh, extreme crisis like COVID-19. Those are examples of patterns like cost reduction. Obviously, you want to cut costs in the beginning, not to go bankrupt. And you want to be fully transparent towards your team and the customers. But at the end, you also have to keep innovating because the end of the crisis is coming. And then whoever will be prepared better and not uh, behaving in a negative way towards the employees, not stopping the innovation, not firing people, those will win post-crisis. And this is sort of the, uh, the planning that I have done, similar to the uh, other pattern planning for Wall Street. And the general idea is that when we have this kind of extreme crisis, what we want first is to show leadership, strong leadership and direction and adjust the direction according to the current needs of the company and the market. Then, of course, we want to get some defensive actions in place, like cut costs, get loans, get funding, get all kinds of things that uh, can help us to survive. But it's ex uh, equally important to keep innovating. And eventually, uh, once the crisis, like now we are feeling that crisis is on the way out, starting slowly to speed up, and, uh, and gain the momentum on the exit of, from the crisis. And the last thing I want to say is just to mention this book from Daniel Kahneman, or general researcher on uh, behavioral economics. And if you haven't read, read this book, I strongly recommend you to do it, is that the book is basically talking about uh, uh, the first intuit fast and intuitive system in our brain that responds very quickly, but without much logic. It's both mostly instincts versus slow and deliberate system that is used very rarely. And the first system is based on, on, uh, uh, on millions of years of uh, evolution. And there are certain bugs or certain behaviors that sort of the most of the time work, but sometimes they don't. And, and uh, I want to show two of them. The first one is illusion of control. I think in current environment, it's obvious that this is actually a big deal. Uh, and although we, feel that we are in control of our destiny and destiny of our company. In reality, you know, when things like COVID-19 happen, uh, our control over the world is apparently very, very limited. And the sec second type, uh, thing, which is a very important one, is uh, save the certainty effect. And that's where um, people spend, take risks when, when they're in trouble. And they don't take risk when everything is, is working okay. That's why when we engage with our customers and their business is going fine, they find it very difficult to make any significant changes. Uh, therefore, a good crisis like COVID-19 is actually an opportunity for a very significant change. So the stranger is coming. They are coming if you want it or not. It's just a matter of being prepared for that. 
And again, if you go to our booth, you can get the excerpt from the book. You can also get some cards and, um, and download the mini book that we wrote a few weeks ago about dealing with quarantine situation. And thank you. All right, thank you, Penny. I took me a while to understand what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed that <laughs> very much, uh, especially timely advice. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but uh, you can go to the sponsors tab, Umbrella, where you will find all of our sponsors: Packet, Contain Solutions, Renship, then CNCF, Honeycomb, Aqua Security, Kinfolk, Giant Swarm, and Cloudbees. And they're all sat there waiting to talk to you. So go and speak to them. Yeah. You can download these things and also speak to Penny if he's still around. Um, next up, we have yoga, 50 minutes of stretching, making sure that we're all remaining energized throughout the day. And when that's over, we're coming back with two tracks again. I've got uh, Ken Owens, who was at the original Software Circus on track one, where the talk Curiosity Does Not Kill the Cat. And on track two is Roberto Barbini with Leon, Beyond Acceptance Testing, Domain Driven Tests. I hope to see you all back here in about 12 minutes. Um, have fun in the meantime, and Penny, thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.